With the help of my friend Tristan, this video is going to give you a short history of Islam. In 610, Muhammad received his first revelations in a cave outside Mecca, and in 612 began to preach. By 622, he traveled to and consolidated the tribes of Yathrib, becoming the leader, Sayyid, of this so-called super tribe, the Medina. The powers in Mecca were displeased with Muhammad and his followers. Both sides conducted raids and warfare against one another. In 624, Muhammad directed his followers to face away from Jerusalem during prayer, and instead face Mecca, a move which symbolically distinguished Islam from Christianity and Judaism. It also displayed to the powers in Mecca that Muhammad had his eye on taking the holy city. In 630, Muhammad marched on Mecca with an army of 10,000. The city surrendered. Muhammad died in 632, with many tribes of the Arabian Peninsula united under Islam. The first caliph, or steward of the Islamic world, was Abu Bakr, father-in-law of Muhammad. He succeeded in crushing the rebelling Arab tribes and solidifying Islam's hold on the peninsula between 632 and 634. The next caliph, Umar, focused the Ummah's efforts outwards, leading raids and conquering of neighboring territories of the Persian and Byzantine empires. In 638, Jerusalem was conquered, and by 641, the entirety of Syria, Palestine, and Egypt were under the caliph's control. The third caliph, Uthman, continued the expansion into North Africa and easterly towards South Asia and India. However, under Uthman, developing unrest would lead to conflict. Historians and different varieties of Muslims debate the real reason Uthman's rule came to rebellion. But at the very least, we know that he played favorites by giving members of his Umayyad family official positions. In 656, rebels assassinated Uthman in his home. In the fallout from Uthman's assassination came five years of civil war, known as the first fitna, the first temptation. Ali, Muhammad's cousin, was chosen in Medina to be the fourth caliph. Ali's rule was rejected in Syria, where Muawiyah, a member of Uthman's Umayyad family, felt obligated to avenge the death of his kinsman. Muawiyah declared a rival caliphate in Damascus and through skirmish and arbitration, became the fifth caliph in 661. Muawiyah's ascent to caliph marked the end of the first four caliphs, known as the Rashidun, the rightly guided ones, and began the era of the Umayyad caliphs. Umayyad caliphs behaved much more like traditional monarchs, fighting off rebel groups and Ali loyalists until 691. In 691, the Dome of the Rock was completed in Jerusalem as new schools of Islamic thought were born. Muslims were calling for the Quran to not merely be a prop of a king to legitimize his rule. The time under Caliph al-Malik was also when Arabic replaced Persian as the official language of the empire. Under Caliph al-Walid I, the Arab empire reached its zenith stretching from the border of modern-day India all the way through Spain and the Iberian Peninsula. But during the reign of Umar II, it was clear that the vast empire was on unstable footing. It faced the natural limitations of all expansionist agricultural economies. Additionally, Umar advocated that the so-called dhimmis, the non-Muslims living in the empire, convert to Islam. Those who did so were exempt from paying the special tax for non-Muslims, the jizya which meant government revenues also declined during this time. The Abbasid family took advantage of the administrative problems under the Umayyads, occupying Kufa in 749 and toppling the last Umayyad caliph, Mansur II, in 750. Assisting the Abbasid's claim to the caliphate, a closer blood relation to Muhammad, they descended directly from his youngest uncle. Though seeing a pious member of Muhammad's family as caliph was something many in the empire desired, the Abbasids quickly established themselves as absolute monarchs. Caliph al-Rashid called himself the shadow of God on earth, leaving the administrative work to his vizier while he tended to traditional monarchical duties, such as being a final court of appeals or leading troops into battle. The Abbasid Caliphate was a time of contradictions. While the religious of society desired a more egalitarian and pious empire, the Caliph and other elites lived in luxury. On the other hand, this was also an era of Islamic economic activity, art, medicine, math, astronomy, and literature. But as the year 1000 approached, the Abbasids were simply unable to administer to the entirety of the empire. A new organization arrived. The Abbasid Caliph lost political power, left to be a figurehead, but not a governor. Different areas of the Ummah decentralized to be governed independently. First, there were the Fatimids in North Africa, Syria, and Palestine. Second, the individual emirs of the Seljuk Turks, controlling city-states in Iraq, Iran, and Central Asia. Individual Muslims in differing states felt part of a greater Islamdom, but there were two major shocks in store. 
In 1099, Christian crusaders successfully took Jerusalem and established states in Palestine, Lebanon, and modern-day Turkey. The scattered emirs were unable to unite well enough to resist. The second shock came in the form of the Mongol Horde, which starting in 1219 raged through Islamdom, leaving death and destruction everywhere. As Karen Armstrong describes in her book, Islam, A Short History, corpses filled the streets and refugees fled to Syria, Egypt, or India. Once great cities like Bukhara and Baghdad were pillaged. As for the Seljuk Turks, they submitted immediately to the Mongols. Around 1260, the map looked a bit like this, as the Mongols conquered or raided massive swaths of the world. And Mongol government fascinated the Muslims, especially because the Mongols themselves brought no spirituality or religion with them. In fact, by the beginning of the 1300s, three of the four divided Mongol Khanates embraced Islam. As the Mongol Empire eventually dwindled, the taking areas of the Byzantine Empire were administered as small Ghazi states. One of the Ghazi families was Osmanli better known as the Ottomans, and by 1400, they controlled much of what was formerly Byzantium. In 1453, Mehmed II conquered Constantinople on behalf of the Ottomans. In 1492, Reconquista Christians retake Southeast Iberia and Granada, fully ejecting the Muslims from Spain. So as the dust of a tumultuous half-millennia settled, three Islamic empires came into view by 1600. First, as mentioned before, the Ottomans in modern-day Turkey, Syria, North Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula. Second, the Mughal Empire in India. And third, the Safavid Empire in Iran. In the Safavid Empire, the ruler Ismail set out to eliminate Sunni Islam, an effort that left Iran mostly Shia and has lasted into the modern day. For a brief moment between 1520 and 1560, the Ottoman Empire was the most powerful on earth. But through the 1600s, it became clear that the agricultural empire was struggling with modernity. Europe's enroachment in the Islamic world began with the Mughal Empire's decline from India in the early 18th century. Between 1789 and 1818, the East India Company under the auspices of the British monarch imposed itself in India. Both these factors left Muslims out of power and as a religious minority, in the Indian subcontinent. Eventually, European colonization made its way into Africa. France took Algeria in 1830 and Tunisia in 1881. The British controlled Egypt by 1882 and Sudan by 1899. In 1912, Italy imposed itself in Libya and France did the same in Morocco. In 1915, Britain and France, in anticipation of victory in the First World War, agreed to divide the territories of the Ottoman Empire, which had sided with the Germans. After the war ended, they established so-called protectorates and a mandate system in Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, and Jordan. In doing so, they stuffed different peoples of different ethnicity and religious backgrounds into arbitrary borders. One wondering why the Middle East is constantly full of violence should start here in their search for answers. Turks in Anatolia fought against post-war partitioning and formed an independent Turkey in 1923. In 1947, the British finally left India, partitioning majority Hindu India and majority Muslim Pakistan as two separate states. 1948, Arabs in Palestine lose the space to the nation of Israel with the support of the newly formed United Nations. The 1948 nine-month Israeli-Arab conflict left around 700,000 Palestinian Arabs exiled and solidified the state of Israel. Israel would have further brief battles with the Arabs and Palestinians throughout the 20th century. Newly independent Islamic countries governed in different ways. Egypt, Syria, and Turkey organized mostly secular governments, naturally with varying degrees of authoritarianism. Others, most notably Saudi Arabia, based their administration on fundamentalist Sunni Islam better known as Wahhabism. In Iran, the 1979 revolution took the country from a constitutional monarchy to a Shia Islamic Republic, with an Ayatollah as the supreme leader. Now that was a lot and very fast. To finish the last leg of our journey, here's my friend Tristan from Step Back History. Thanks, Will. So from 1979 until 1989, the Soviet Union fought against Mujahideen rebels in Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden, one of the Mujahideen, would later declare war against the United States and its allies, seeking to remove all foreign troops from what they called Islamic lands. The culmination of this effort arrived in 2001. The U.S. invaded his refuge in Afghanistan quickly thereafter. In 2003, the U.S. toppled the secular Ba'athist government in Iraq, creating a Sunni insurgency in the west of Iraq. 2010 a series of revolutions toppled governments in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen with similar protests in many other countries. 
The results of these uprisings were mixed. They came to be known as the Arab Spring. One of those countries with protests was Syria, where civil war broke out in 2011. This was right next door to Iraq, where the US was withdrawing its remaining combat troops. The culmination of these two events created the power vacuum necessary for the rise of ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, which took many swaths of territory in 2014 and launched terror attacks worldwide. Their leader, Islamic scholar Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, proclaimed a new caliphat and bestowed himself the same name as the first caliph after the death of Muhammad. One of the things that I didn't have time to cover in this video is just the vast diversity of the Muslim world. They're not just in the Middle East where only about 20% of Muslims live. About 13% of all Muslims live in Indonesia alone. And as a diverse group of people, there's also big splits in ideology, especially on theology. Sunni and Shia, certainly. But within Sunnism, there's Wahhabism from Saudi Arabia and the savage ideology of ISIS. So if you'd like to examine some of the theology of ISIS, maybe some of the things that get wrong, be sure to watch the companion video to this one by clicking here. It's a video by my friend Tristan from Step Back History. He's doing great work and definitely deserves your subscription. And hey, don't forget to subscribe here as well. Later, guys.